This is chapter four of the Americans, the Union in Peril. Open your textbook to page 154 where you'll see this picture. Chapter four covers the time of 1850 all the way to 1877. In this time period, you'll be looking at the lead up to the Civil War, the war itself, and then Reconstruction. On this page, page 155, you'll see the major questions that we'll be dealing with in Chapter 4. The first question is, how can the Union be saved? The next question is, is it possible to compromise on an ethical issue such as slavery? And what are the obstacles to altering an institution such as slavery that is fundamental to a region's economy and way of life? On page 156, you will see Chapter 4, Section 1, The Divisive Politics of Slavery. The main idea of this section is here, disagreements over slavery heightened regional tensions and led to the breakup of the Union. Here you'll see a very dramatic picture of one of the most important politicians of the time period, John C. Calhoun. John C. Calhoun represented the state of South Carolina and one, was one of the leading voices in the government on states' rights. On page 156, you will see a section entitled Slavery in the Territories. In this section, you will see how the issue of statehood for California led to the Compromise of 1850. The question of whether California would come into the nation as a slave state or a free state led many states in the South to threaten secession, the formal withdrawal of a state from the Union. This was because when California was created, if it became a free state, it would limit slavery's access to the Pacific Ocean. Southern plantation owners who needed to export cotton to Asia would not be able to carry their products to market on the backs of slaves because when they entered California, those slaves would become free men. In order to satisfy the complaints of Southern plantation owners and slave owners, the Compromise of 1850 was created. This allowed for California to enter the Union as a free state. In 1858, you'll see uh, what else was offered to the Southern slave owners in exchange for California being admitted as a free state. The Fugitive Slave Act was passed, and the idea of popular sovereignty was instituted for all new states entering the Union. Popular sovereignty is listed right here. It is the right to vote for or against slavery in new territories. This is the idea that democracy would be used to s solve the issue of slavery. Also on page 158, you'll see a large section entitled Protest, Resistance, and Violence. In this page, there's a large picture of a very important American. This is Harriet Tubman, who was called Moses by the slaves that she helped to free. She was what was called a conductor on the Underground Railroad. It's important to remember that the Underground Railroad was neither underground, nor was it a railroad. It was a series of hiding places and safe houses that allowed slaves to hide as they traveled from the slave-owning South through the northern United States to Canada. The Fugitive Slave Act required northerners to turn in any escaped slaves that they saw. This makes the issue of slavery more problematic because now northerners can't turn a blind eye to slavery in the South giving them the excuse that because they didn't own slaves, it wasn't their problem. Now, every American is intimately involved in the oppression of African slaves. Uncle Tom's Cabin was written in 1852 by Harriet Beecher Stowe, and this book emphasized that slavery was not just a political difference between the North and the South, but it was a moral struggle that God was judging all people by. One of the important effects of Uncle Tom's Cabin was that now northern abolitionists increased their protests against the Fugitive Slave Act, and it increased the debate over slavery in the government.
In this section here entitled Bleeding Kansas, you'll read about how the entry of Kansas into the Union ultimately led to violence. When the people of Kansas were allowed to vote on whether to be a slave state or a free state, people from Missouri crossed into Kansas, voted illegally, and won a fraudulent majority for the pro-slavery candidates. This new government was called the LeCompton government, and it promptly issued a series of pro-slavery acts. Abolitionists were furious over this fraud, and ultimately attacked other Kansas natives with swords, butchering them in their own houses. Bleeding Kansas is the first time we see people taking up violence in the name of slavery. What's significant about this is that it's now whites who are killing whites over the issue of slavery. The issue of slavery became violent even in the federal government. And on page 161, you'll see this picture, which was a famous cartoon of the time showing how even the senators became violent toward one another when debating slavery. On page 161, you'll also notice a new section called New Political Parties Emerge. With the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the issue of Bleeding Kansas, the political party called the Whigs was finished. The Whigs disbanded, and a new political party was established that we call the Republican Party. In addition to the Republican Party, another political party was established called the Free Soilers, the Free Soil Party primarily objected to competing with slavery uh, as an economic system. No one was going to pay higher prices for a business that employed free men when they could pay lower prices for a product produced by slaves. The creation of the Free Soil Party is important because it shows that opposition to slavery wasn't just on a moral basis. Many northern whites didn't mind blacks being enslaved at all. What they didn't like was having to compete with slaves. In the section on page 162, you'll see conflicts leading to secession. One of the major conflicts that led to secession in 1860 was the Supreme Court decision in the Dred Scott case. This is Dred Scott right here. And what happened was that a uh, slave owner took Dred Scott, his slave, from Missouri into the free territory of Illinois. And during this time, Dred Scott would essentially have been considered a free man. However, the Supreme Court ruled against Dred Scott. According to the court, Dred Scott lacked any legal standing to sue in federal court because he was not and could not ever be a citizen. Furthermore, it ruled officially that African slaves were not people under the law. African slaves under the law were property. The Dred Scott decision is important politically, economically, and morally. Politically, the Dred Scott decision reignited the debate over slavery and its use in the Northern Territory. Economically, the Dred Scott decision was a disaster for the United States and ultimately caused an economic recession. When the Supreme Court decided that Africans were not citizens, but rather property, it called into question the ability of our system to adequately answer the issue of slavery. This led banks in Europe and the United States to restrict lending to the new states and the country as a whole. Because they weren't sure of what the outcome over slavery would be, bankers didn't want to risk their money. When bankers stopped lending to the United States, it caused a depression. Morally, the Dred Scott decision was important because now it ultimately answered the question of slavery in the Northern Territories in, the, in favor of the slave owners. This meant that under the law, even northern abolitionists couldn't fight back anymore. And when there was no democratic or legal answer to slavery, 
the only ultimate answer is violence. On page 163, you'll see an interesting photograph showing Abraham Lincoln standing next to his opponent for the uh, Senate seat from Illinois, Stephen Douglas. This is an interesting photograph because it shows just how tall Abraham Lincoln was compared to the relatively short Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas favored the idea of popular sovereignty, or the idea of allowing states to vote on whether to allow for slavery. Abraham Lincoln favored an immediate abolition of all slavery everywhere. On page 163, you'll also see another example of violence leading up to the Civil War, and that is Harper's Ferry, where John Brown, who had been involved in the violence in Bleeding Kansas, relocated to uh, begin a slave uprising uh, by seizing the Harper's Ferry arsenal and arming a local slave population. On page 164, you will see an interesting painting showing John Brown going to his hanging. John Brown is one of the most interesting characters leading up to the Civil War. Today, many people consider him to be a martyr, and others consider him to be a madman. But in the election of 1860, with the victory by Abraham Lincoln, the southern states broke away to form the Confederacy, or the Confederate States of America, and they were led by Jefferson Davis. So here are all of the vocabulary terms for Chapter 4.1. Please continue to make vocabulary cards and lists. Chapter 4.2 is entitled, The Civil War Begins. The main idea of this section will be that shortly after the nation's southern states seceded from the Union, war began between the North and the South. Page 168 details the strengths and strategies of each side in the Civil War. At the top you'll see a very interesting pair of photographs, one showing a Union soldier and one showing a Confederate soldier. It also shows the military strengths of each Essentially, the North had all of the advantages, and the South had a few, but not very many. Essentially, the North had the industry, the weapons, as well as the population to make the Civil War a very quick and easy battle. Despite all of the advantages for the Union Army in the Civil War, the early years of the war were a disaster for Lincoln and his generals. Here on page 169, you'll see a, a section entitled Bull Run, which was the first battle of the Civil War and was a victory for the South. On page 171, you'll see a, one of the most important battles in American history, the Battle of Antietam. The Battle of Antietam is the bloodiest single day battle in American history with casualties totaling more than 26,000. The Emancipation Proclamation is one of the most important documents in American history. It's one of the reasons why many people believe that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves during the Civil War, when in fact the, the Emancipation Proclamation only freed slaves in states that were in rebellion. One of the questions we have to ask ourselves about the Emancipation Proclamation is why Abraham Lincoln waited so long before he issued it. On page 173, you'll see a section that describes life during wartime and a new word called conscription, which was a draft that forced men to serve in the army. We need to ask ourselves if the war to free the slaves was something so important to so many people, why were men forced to serve in the army? Why didn't they just volunteer? In fact, the war was so unpopular that conscription led to riots, the most violent of which took place in New York City. Also on page 174, we'll see a very important change that occurred as a result of the Civil War, and that is the passage of the nation's first income tax. If we remember all the way back to the Revolutionary War, taxes were one of the reasons we ultimately declared our independence. Taxes that were imposed prior to the Revolutionary War were caused by debts incurred during the French and Indian War. Taxes that are being passed during the Civil War are similar. Therefore, we can draw a connection between these that war ultimately leads 
to more taxes. On page 174, please find the vocabulary for this section listed here and continue to add those to your vocabulary cards or lists.